Nothing like calling the name of Jesus. Thank you, choir. Kirk Franklin has a song that says, Jesus is the reason for the season. We remember that around here, and I'm grateful for it. Last Sunday, our brother, Mark Burt, and I talked about a recipe for peace. And we listed six ingredients for peace. And those ingredients that we talked about last week had a lot to do with the attitude of the heart that would lead to actions that result in peace. Today I want to share um, another recipe, but this one is a recipe for joy. And actually, the passage of scripture that I want to use as the foundation for this recipe was not read this morning, so I'm going to read it to you now. It's found in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we usually do an Old Testament reading and a new and often the gospel. So we leave out the epistle a lot. But today I want to focus on this epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 22. Listen again for the word of God. Rejoice always. This is a familiar passage. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from everything evil. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this holy word. I invite you to pray with me. Loving and gracious God, we thank you indeed for the opportunity to think about, speak about joy. The joy that has come to the world in Jesus, the joy that is renewed in our hearts as often as as we are open to it. I pray that you will let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and all of our hearts now be acceptable to you, for you are our strength, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I love scripture songs, and there is one about rejoice, 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 and more always. And again, I say rejoice. You've sung that in maybe camps or with the children, Sunday school somewhere. I love this passage from 1 Thessalonians 5 because of its simple and direct commands given with such authority. Just rejoice like you do that now. <laughs> Pray. Give thanks. Mm -hmm. Seek the Spirit. Accept prophetic words. Test everything. Abstain from evil. That's a pretty good recipe for a whole, your whole life right there. But it certainly can help bring joy. And if you were counting, that's seven, not six, so I'm not using exactly all of that. What I want to focus on for this recipe, like the one we did for peace, this recipe for joy, will have ingredients that are not necessarily all there is, but these Ingredients are indeed the essentials. If you have these, you can be guaranteed you will have a life with deep abiding joy. The first ingredient that I want to mention is prayer. Pray without ceasing, the scripture says. Pray all the time. Of course, not literally. We couldn't quite do that. But we can be in an attitude of prayer just about all the time. So that prayer is our first response to whatever happens during the day or during the year or during your life. To pray without ceasing is to always be ready to pray, to have a prayer on your heart, prayer in the back of your mind. To know that you can always call on God and you want to call on God first, not in the last resort, but as a first resort. Prayer is a great place to start when you are looking for joy. Because you can actually pray and ask God to give you joy. We can pray for joy knowing that God wants us to have joy. And we can know that because we can remember what Jesus said. 
He came that our joy might be full and complete. So the second ingredient, adding to prayer, is to be thankful. <coughs> Not just in your heart, even though it has to start there, but express your gratitude to God and to other people as well. This scripture says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That is a little tune to that tune, but you've heard it already. In everything, that means in every circumstance, the good times and the bad. When you feel joy and when you feel sorrow, you still rejoice and give thanks. I remember one time when I was in college, my first Christmas home, trying to get back to Abilene, Texas from Sanford, Florida. That was quite a trek. Didn't have money for a plane, so I was catching the bus and I was hooking up in Louisiana with some friends who were going to drive the rest of the way to Abilene. I remember they weren't where we were supposed to meet. <laughs> and then I waited, and then I didn't know what to do, and finally um, I had a phone number and I called their mom, the mom of the people who were supposed to meet me. And she said, we just heard from them they had a wreck in somewhere in Louisiana, and they're not going to get to New Orleans to pick you up. I'm so sorry. Thankfully, my brother had just gotten married in New Orleans earlier that year. So I had a number to call and got some help. But I remember thinking all through those series of disappointments, this scripture came to me. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I always wondered what would have happened if they had gotten to me and then had the wreck. There were no casualties, thank God. This car was just messed up and they were delayed getting to school. But nobody got hurt. But I would have been in the back seat of that little Volkswagen they were driving. And it might have been the end of me. Even though I couldn't understand the circumstances and I was certainly disappointed. I remembered to give thanks for what I did have. A number to call their mom. A number to call my brother's mother-in-law in New Orleans, who came to the rescue. I spent the night there and they got me on a plane instead of a bus the next day, so I got to school early. What an amazing story. But if we can just give thanks, even when we don't see what's happening or where it's going to end or how it's going to work out, God has our back. When we are giving thanks, we are mindful of all our blessings and deeply aware of God's goodness toward us. That's what it means to give thanks. Even if things look bad, I know that God has something good in store for me. Right. By the way, joy, the joy that I'm talking about, is not the same as happiness. Sometimes that can be pretty surface and shallow and fleeting as well, happiness. But joy goes much deeper than that. Joy is a state of your soul. It is a deep sense of well-being, much like peace. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. That's joy worth having. So we got prayer as a first ingredient and thankfulness as a second. The third thing I want to encourage us to put in our recipe for joy is to live freely in the spirit. And I mean God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The scripture just says, do not quench the Spirit. Some of you know that means squash it, stamp it out. Don't do that. I wanted to make this in the affirmative. So turn it around to help us to think in terms of wanting to focus on living in the Spirit. Being conscious of Christ's presence in our lives. <coughs> want us to have a, a state of mind to be always knowing the spirit is real. I believe that we can quench the spirit when we try to control everything according to our own finite understanding. Um, if I had been trying to be in control on that trip to a Abilene, Texas, it would have been futile anyway. I had to let go and let God just trust the process. Trust that God was going to get me there. Mm -hmm. We need to let the Spirit of God reign freely so that we can kind of flow and 
follow the leading of the Spirit. Go with the flow, God's flow, though. We must never try to stamp out the Spirit like we put out a fire, for instance. The Spirit is a flame that we should let burn brightly and freely. We want to learn to live practicing the presence of Spirit. Live with Spirit. If you want to have joy, you won't be disappointed. Fourth thing we need to, as a part of this recipe for joy, um, we need to welcome and embrace inspired messages. Now, again, the scriptures didn't state it that way. It stated it in the negative. Do not despise prophetic utterances is what the scripture says. Do not despise a word from the Lord or a word from God. We tend to not think about prophecy or prophesying very much these days. We kind of leave that in the past. We think that it was okay for the prophets of old, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and others. But it's an ancient gift that we think is not so functional or operative today. But the spiritual gift of prophecy is still real and alive and well in certain places in the world and in certain denominations more visible than others. Prophesying is simply speaking forth a word from God or an inspired message. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can focus on that a little better. Most of us like inspired messages because they lift us and they give us information and they help us go forward. God is still speaking. This was the campaign or slogan for the United Church of Christ a few years ago. It may still be, I'm not sure. Oh, that we could be like the boy named Samuel in the Old Testament in the Bible who heard somebody calling his name, Samuel, Samuel, and he ran to Eli. He said, did you call me? Eli said, no. Go back and lay down. Three times I have You know the story, right? Finally, wise Eli said, when you hear the voice again, just be still and say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. That's what we want to do. Listen for the Spirit. Pay attention to utterances that come from God or through other people. Sometimes a word from the Lord can come in a dream, like with Mary and Joseph. Or sometimes it can come through another person with flesh on. An angel, a dream, a real person. God can speak in any way that God chooses. We need to be like Samuel and say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So affirm and embrace and open yourself to prophetic utterances. Some of us have been around general conferences where um, we've had people speak in tongues and had people to um, offer a word from God or to utter a prophecy. Some of you have been prayed for um, by the hat lady, mm -hmm. you know who I'm talking about, mm -hmm. who can tell you things that you wonder, how she knew that? Who told her that? Mm -hmm. Some of you had that experience. Those may be considered inspired messages or a prophetic utterance. You can choose. Don't despise it. Be open to it. At least listen and hear it. See if it's going to happen. The next ingredient helps you do that because it says <coughs> test everything. Don't just take it at face value or just because the person said it, but live with it. Sit with it for a little while. Test everything. Examine it carefully is all that means. To see if there's some truth in it. Because you don't want to reject the truth in your haste of disbelief about prophetic utterance. So we examine every spirit. Joy will come when we know we're dealing with the truth. One of the most joy killers, or the worst joy killers, is untruth or falsehood. Or a lie. Or lying. Sometimes when we get new information, we need to pray again for wisdom and discernment to understand what is true and what is not. Spirit will help you put the information into the right test. This will keep you filled with joy as you know that you're operating in truth and in spirit. Worshiping, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth is the only way to please God. In the 
little epistle called 1 John chapter 4, there's a verse that says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test or examine the spirit to see whether they be from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. End quote. Spirit knows truth everywhere. Spirit can reveal to you what is good and right and best in all the things that you hear and seek as you seek to understand. Our joy remains constant as long as we are careful not to get caught up with falsehood. This last ingredient comes from the example of John the baptizer. You did hear his story read, how the Pharisees sent people to inquire of him, who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you one of the prophets, Elijah? What then? <laughs> they didn't know what to think about John. <laughs> But John did something that we should always do. Sixth ingredient for real joy, be yourself. Mm -hmm. Be who you are, who God made you to be. John could have pretended that he was the Christ or tried to say he was somebody he wasn't, but why? He didn't go there. He simply answered, no, no, not that either. Then who are you? He described himself. That was a coming out. I am the one, the voice crying in the wilderness. I'm the one sent from God to prepare the way. Whoever you are called to be, Spirit will help you understand that and identify it. But the best way to be filled with joy is to know who you are and to be yourself. Be yourself, just like John was himself. Sometimes that might be thought of as coming out. I believe that for many of us, coming out and living out is a great source of deep joy. Who can live a life forever? Who wants to? Who can live in the closet forever? Who wants to? <laughs> Nobody. Coming out is just being yourself. Your real self, your authentic self. Even when there are painful moments, living your truth will eventually and inevitably and ultimately increase your joy. That's my recipe for today. Six simple ingredients that when mixed all together will help you create that deep, lasting joy. Joy, joy, joy that no one can take away. Blessed be God's holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.